are the uh, analysis methods you mostly use to uh, look at the extracellular vesicles? We can isolate the extracellular vesicles from different type of uh, of samples from blood, saliva, uh, saliva, cultural media, and so forth by centrifugation or filtration, or even pre precipitation. And uh, um, the you can perform a general analysis, like uh, simple light scattering to see the size. Uh, you can go a little bit further down looking at antibodies and uh, protein by immunoassays. You can also do some proteomics and some mass specs or some RNA analysis. But most of the time, for um, uh, extracellular vesicles, uh, electron microscopy, like in this picture here, nanoparticle tracking and flow cytometry are the best uh, tools or techniques in order to visualize them, in this case, and analyze them in terms of function and, uh, bless you, um, and uh, function and, and, and uh, content. Um, one of the most common way to look at the uh, extracellular vesicles is uh, using microspheres. Uh, microspheres can be um, um, can bind some antibodies that uh, can uh, uh, bind our protein into our uh, into the vesicles and therefore um, make sure that the the vesicle is fluorescent and therefore can be measured by by full cytometer. Uh, Even in this case, refractive index and sides are really important because uh, uh, you need to know that uh, above a specific threshold and below a specific threshold of your floor of, of your um, wavelength, the reading may not be accurate. So, um, for uh, if I remember correctly, for extracellular vesicles, PBS is still fine, but there needs to be some anti-fading agent into the solution, into the fluidics, in order to make sure that the tiny, tiny bit attached to the vesicles or even the, the, the antibody can be visible enough without any, any artifact of the light. Um, this is an example where uh, we spin down our cells or our vesicles, uh, we stain them in different ways, adding antibodies and dyes, so then the fax sorter can discern which one are the largest one, uh, the larger vesicles or the smaller vesicles through uh, different uh, uh, excitation, in this case is uh, green, 488, and a different size and so forth. Okay. For applications like extracellular vesicles uh, or any other tiny um, compartments of the cell, uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, development in flow cytometry. Um, also, uh, considering uh, the different type of lasers and uh, the combination of different PMTs or different detectors in order to maximize the, um, uh, ana the, 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 the content of uh, uh, the readings, pretty much. So the, cells are going, the cells are going through here. The laser shines that they uh, excite the cells. The cell emits light and then can get captured by different PMTs of different colors to make sure that whatever is it's red, it's the real signal. For smaller um, particles, 
uh, the high resolution characterization has been uh, a really, really powerful uh, tool in the last uh, couple of years because it allows us to uh, see in uh, very, very high definition and resolution uh, <coughs> uh, different nanoparticles that we can use to target specific compartments of the cell, specific proteins of the cell. Um, <coughs> Uh, and uh, even drugs, even uh, the uh, combination of uh, uh, drug delivery into a cell uh, with fax sorting can be done with a uh, high resolution um, flow cytometry. Uh, I think, yes, those, those two papers are on the hands out, so if you want to take a look, are uh, quite cool. Uh, yeah, that's uh, okay. So, I want to now go to a second application, which is very, very uh, widely used, which is uh, uh, DNA content, or more importantly, uh, dead versus alive cells. <clears throat> in order to look at the uh, DNA, uh, well, in order to look at the um, viability of the cell, we can look at the uh, content of DNA. Uh, and to look at the content of DNA and to measure the proliferation, we have a couple of different uh, uh, methods. Um, we can perform a DNA histogram or a BRDU or anti-BRDU uh, approach, um, specifically in, uh, in vivo. Or in a fixed uh, sample, but not only fixed, but in cell culture, uh, multi-approach of uh, host and PI, which are two different dyes uh, that stain the uh, DNA, and BRDU that also stains DNA in different, in different portions, um, or um, stain for, dye, uh, for uh, antibodies and uh, um, uh, apply a, a more uh, uh, immunological approach. The DNA binding dyes are very uh, widely used. Uh, the most uh, common is propidium iodide, PI. Uh, then there is a tidium bromide, OST, uh, and other specific dyes that will uh, stain specific areas of the DNA, depending on what you are looking for, basically. Uh, each of them have uh, specific excitation and emission, mostly on the violet, on the UV range. Some of them have uh, uh, 488 nanometers wavelength, which is uh, on the green um, uh, portion of the spectrum, or the 633, which is on the uh, far red uh, side of the spectrum. Um, you can work with the specificity, so you can uh, use dye uh, sorry, PI to just stay in the dead cell, regardless what type of, 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 of compartment of the DNA you want to stain, or you want to specifically select uh, nucleotides, and therefore using specific dyes. Uh, and as I said, uh, viability assays, so, uh, sorry, for viability assays, uh, um, to see whether the live cell is dying or not, Drug 5 uh, or um, host are the most used one. Um, in uh, the majority of the case, you can uh, fix your cells. Again, that specific time point, you select uh, uh, various time point. At that time point, one, you fix them, you stain them, and then the sample can be sorted in a very, very easy way. Um, and this is mostly when you need to stain, uh, when you need to uh, associate an antibody and therefore a fluorophore to, um, to a protein. Fixation has uh, pros and cons. Uh, the quality can be reduced depending on the quality of the fixa fixative and depending on the application that you want to use. But it's always good to consider a fixed approach that then can give you a rough idea on what the live approach could be on the same set of samples, of course. Uh, 
you can use, uh, um, it, it's possible to permeabilize the cell or permeabilize the nuclei with um, uh, temperature approaches or with detergents. Again, it's always depending on the users and more importantly on the type of question you're trying to answer, what is the best approach to use. Generally, a fixation uh, can be done uh, dehydrating or uh, um, uh, using ethanol or methanol. In this case, it will uh, create uh, um, the, the, a coagulation of proteins where the, per, the, the dye for the nuclei, for instance, or for any other compartment may or may not go through easily. You can cross-link the protein with the formaldehyde. In this case, you have uh, some sort of cage, so the cross-linking would create uh, a, a cage of protein around the cell or inside the cell in order to access to, nu to the nuclei or to any other component in a different ways, or using detergents uh, like Triton X, MP4, or saponin uh, to get uh, <clears throat> anything that you want to use more uh, directly um, um, staining into the cell. Regardless the type of staining that you're using, the type of fixative and so forth, in an ideal world, you treat your cells, you put it on the flow cytometer, and then you want to look at the number of events versus uh, the fluorescent intensity, and uh, ideally you have, at some point, there is an increment of fluorescence that uh, is proportional to the number of events, so the number of events is, of course, the counting, so um, that may decrease over the time, but it will still give you perfect readings in a sense. The real world is not like this. The real world is uh, taking, takes in consideration many different factors, taking in consideration the amount of DNA content in the, uh, in the cell, takes in consideration the type of user that you use, that, that the cell, that, I mean, actually, the sample preparation itself, and the instrument, the instrument calibration, the instrument setup, and the instrument noise. Bless you. So you always need to deal with something like this, where you still have a certain amount of DNA that's, that goes into, uh, um, that's, that gives you a specific uh, uh, amount of, of intensity that changes depending on what you're looking at. In this specific case, we are talking about cell cycle. So we are looking at uh, G1 phase, G2 phase, and S phase, where, as you know, the, the content of DNA inside the cells varies depending on the type of phase. So if you have a sample that uh, uh, it's, if you want to sort cells that are in G phase, G1 phase only, for whatever reason, then uh, you need to look for the highest content of the, the lowest content of DNA and uh, uh, setting up the, the dyes and the machine accordingly. Okay? The noise that we have, we'll be talking about, <coughs> can be done, can be. Uh, uh, reason of uh, biological vibration uh, variation. So if we have subclones or if you have different type of cells, uh, technical reasons like laser alignment, hydrodynamic focusing, and 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 uh, and so forth. And of course, sample preparation. Sometimes the fixative is not good enough, so your cells are not properly stained, and uh, you're reading it's crap. Similarly to what I told you before, uh, one other reason is uh, the misalignment, or uh, um, well one other reason of uh, the heterogeneity you can, you can find on, uh, on far sorting is uh, laser alignment, but uh, 
speed of rate, uh, speed of uh, flow. A low flow will allow the cell to go to pass one after the other within the laser and tend to have much cleaner signal or readings. A higher flow will allow the, clump, the cells to travel together, to clump, giving you much more noise and much dirty signal. This is an exp uh, uh, another comparison of using different type of fixative. With the same sample, a 70% ethanol can give you a much cleaner uh, reading compared to the, the formaldehyde. Causing clumps will, uh, I mean, the formation of clumps will uh, give you a very, very dirty and uh, chaotic dot plot where, but on the same time, <clears throat> knowing uh, what the result can be or what to expect, the doublets or the cell clumps can be gated, as I said before, in a specific way to avoid that area and consider other, uh, sorry, to avoid this area and consider the real one that would be more likely this one here, the real reading. Um, and this is another, again, strategy to look at the different readings for different population, again, forward scatter and eye scatter and side scatter, clump, uh, gating accordingly for uh, single cells, in this case, viable cells, in this other case, will allow you to get a final um, dot plot with the real data. Then, logarithmically speaking, it will show like this. I don't know why I put this slide, but um, as a final result, you can have um, a quite uh, clean data on where the G1 uh, um, sample are. But what is interesting is that this is, was supposed to be a, sorry, this, this PowerPoint is no right. Anyways, the clean data, the final result can also be altered uh, or can, can also be used to compare different applications. In this case, we have our culture. We do the, we do the, the flow cytometry. Uh, we have this reading, different type of cell cycles. But we want to see on a different uh, treatments. You want to leave them, for instance, overnight on an incubator to uh, grow or to see what is the uh, content after X amount of time, after the first reading. We want to treat with drugs. We want to treat it with a uh, block reagent, uh, s phase block reagent. But in this case, this is our reading initial reading after the blocking of the S phase, the DNA, it's much higher in the S phase compared to the initial reading, as well as a uh, um, mitotic blocker, where we have much, much higher signal into the G phase. So a f an initial reading can be uh, used to screen uh, the first um, set of cells, in uh, this case in G1, and then being a starting point to analyze different treatments or different conditions. Uh, <clears throat> in the case of primary cells, when in the case of a biopsy, for instance, or a, a blood uh, um, screening, <clears throat> it's... Uh, it's also good to uh, look at the data in, uh, um, and, and analyze
recognize the uh, unemployed G1 and G2 to see whether the alteration of uh, any form of agent uh, that is present on the cell uh, can have any meaning. In this case, you overlap in the two will give you uh, a different uh, um, a ratio of the two readings we will tell you potentially the meaning of the drug that has been used in the two different uh, applications or, or the treatment and so forth. Uh, now, <clears throat> we have a graph or a dot plot, but it's not necessarily the graph will tell us everything that we need. It's a visual impact, it's a visual, you can retrieve numbers, of course, but the most important thing is that where do we see the G phase bound, uh, boundary, with, uh, sorry, where do we see the boundary between the G1 phase and the S phase in, uh, into a, a graph like that? And that's where the mathematical uh, algorithm kick in. So basically, there are many different type of algorithms and programs that you can use to calculate after the reading of the flow cytometer what are the percentage of the different, uh, of the different uh, um, samples that you are looking at and define exactly where one peak uh, starts and ends compared to the next one. Um, in live conditions, um, the flow cytometer approach is a little bit more tricky, as I said, but still can be done. Uh, the fixation is not required, so all the different uh, type of artifacts that we make or issue that we may encounter with the fixation are not there. Uh, you can still do a viability assay, so looking at the dead versus alive cells. But, <clears throat> but the, 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 the most uh, common application is to look at the expression of the protein. So you are uh, transgenically modifying a cell um, with, uh, with any fluorescent proteins, uh, and you look at the expression through the fact sorting, looking at how much intensity is giving you uh, on a specific uh, um, application. You can do a stem cell isolation. Stem cells, most of the time, have a very, very high ratio to nuclei versus cytoplasm, so very large nucleus and very little cytoplasm, so are very, very easy to detect. You can do functional studies, so looking at the cells that are about to die, but are not in the, they're not yet in a necrotic stage. Or uh, you can uh, uh, sort different population of cells and then reculture again to make sure that what you are reculturing is just what you've been sorting. Um, in any of those applications, there are other factors to consider. To consider, one is the temperature of the time, the length of incubation, how much are you incubating them, uh, and if the incubation can be deadly, as we talked about before, uh, and uh, the concentration of the dye. You are still dealing with a live sample, so the dye can be, um, uh, can, can, can make a, a big difference if it's too concentrated or not that concentrated. Okay. Any questions on those two applications? Yes. Uh, if it fits the cells in permanently high, yeah. and leave it for, say, for a four to five days, both, and then before the, like, before the cells die, they won't get a problem. No, OK. Yes. Uh, fixation with form formaldehyde uh, with, uh, for such a long time is never, so it's never good. The reason is uh, uh, the cross-linking of the protein can cause damages on the protein that you're looking at, such as uh, uh, degradation, such as uh, um, uh, 
cross-linking with other proteins and therefore uh, interaction with protein to, uh, with that different proteins that is going to give you different readings. And um, and chemically speaking, uh, uh, increment of uh, acidic um, uh, acidity into the media, which means that uh, the reading, the, the, the fractive index and so forth is going to be screwed up. So a couple of different reasons by which it's always, always uh, recommended to fix, and this is also in microscopy, in any sort of uh, immunos immunostochemical approach, you fix your sample, you stain it right away, and you look it right away, or in the shortest amount of time possible. You can, of course, harvest the cells on a Friday night, stain them, and then look at them on, on Monday, that's fine but not in a larger scale, in a larger time. It's when it's doing it. <laughs> it's when it might be fine, yeah. I mean, the, the concept is that the best, in, in the fluorescent microscopy and fact sorting, whatever you need to stain for protein, for antibodies, the best result comes right after the fixation or right after the preparation of the sample. When the sample is ready to be analyzed, go for it. That's the best output that you can possibly have. If you are staining, preparing the sample, and then a couple of days later you look at it and it's not good, then uh, okay, it's not good. What if I used? What if I looked at it the day, the same day? Fluorescent dyes can fade out with temperature, with light, of course. So preservation of the sample is also crucial. Yeah, that, that, that could work. That could work because you're actually staining with the dye. You're not using any epitope, uh, any antibody that would bind to an epitope. So the preservation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, epitopes for antibody staining is crucial, but in a dye application like this, it's fairly straightforward. If you want to measure the number of knives yeah. in cells, so it's still uh, possible? Yes, yes. You measure the viability of the cell, dead versus alive, even in fixed cells, because you are looking at the content of the DNA. The DNA can be damaged or can be intact, and the damaged DNA is staying with a dye, and the intact staining is, is, is staying with another dye, or it's not stained, so you have, uh, you know, colors versus white, in a sense, uh, because it's based on the of the concentration of the of the DNA versus. Uh, but any other protein application or any other expression pattern needs to be done fairly soon. Any other questions? Okay. So I want to leave you with this uh, with this uh, uh, in situ application. I, I, when I found it uh, last year, I was I was really fascinated about it because uh, it's one of those exotic applications where. Um, you know, biologists usually are labeled as uh, the nerdy guy who is uh, looking at the single cell and then studying very, very pioneeristic things. But there are also a bunch of other biologists which are on, on boats or uh, submarines or in the Antarctic or whatever to study different type of things, very more, more exotic than, but still very interesting. And this is actually an application of flow cytometry in situ in a, for, uh, for phytoplankton. So for tiny, tiny animals that are floating on the ocean. Okay? And they use this cytobuoy, which is uh, pretty much a, flow a, a, a floating flow cytometer. It sucks water from the surface of the ocean and then uh, through the laser each single animal contained into the ocean, into the seawater, would be analyzed. It sucks the 
water with the animal, the animal goes through the laser, phytoplankton and zooplankton are autofluorescent, so we don't need to select specific uh, dyes or specific, uh, we need to stain it, it's just a simple way of uh, looking at, uh, uh, at animals uh, live, in live condition of course, uh, and to categorize them, to look at them, and to, yeah, and then to co look at the content of the proteins, or the content of the fluorophores, or even just a single shape, okay? And I found it quite particularly fascinating, because uh, it's one of those, uh, it's one of those applications that you really wouldn't think about it, unless you you are in the field, but it's, uh, it shows uh, what, uh, it shows uh, how wide is the application, is fluorescent cytometer application from uh, uh, biomedical application to uh, marine biology application and, and so forth, okay, I think this is his last slide, well, no, there are a couple of, yes, anyway, okay, so, uh, I think that's it. Um, I I want to um, just remind you that if you have any questions for uh, the microscopy uh, part or this this uh, fax sorting, uh, just feel free to email me or come upstairs. I'm on the eighth floor. And uh, if you uh, any of you is interested on having uh, interested on having a, a facility tour or uh, a more in-depth uh, application in microscopy, just let me know. We can arrange, we can book a microscope, I can show you some of the application. For fax sorting, uh, uh, I, we don't have, in the facility, we don't have a fax sorter that is available for, for, uh, for, um, uh, for this type of usage, but I can put you in contact with the uh, medical uh, uh, school where there are, there is a fax sorting machine, uh, facility, sorry. Okay? Thank you for listening. The...